Uh, good evening, everyone. Welcome to another instalment of Talking History Online. My name is Christy Kokigi. I'm the Director of Public Engagement here at the History Trust of South Australia. And it's my pleasure to bring you Talking History Online every month here. Um, now, we're just waiting for everyone to join. Um, so before we get started, I would like to acknowledge uh, the land that we're broadcasting to you tonight on from is the land of the Ghana people and that I'm personally coming to you from Ghana land. Um, <clears throat> the History Trust of South Australia respects the primary place of Aboriginal people in the history of this place and we acknowledge that our story commenced long before Governor Highmarsh proclaimed the new province of South Australia and established colonial government in 1836. And also that Aboriginal people have a long history here that extends millennia into the past. Um, and that if we can build a shared understanding of this history, of our history together, that's really crucial to, to reconciliation and creating a positive future for all of us here in South Australia. Um, so, like I said, welcome tonight. We're just waiting, people are starting to, to join. Um, those of you who have attended a talking history before, you know the drill, you know what I'm going to talk to you about for the next few minutes. So um, feel free to run off and get your drinks and your snacks for tonight. For those that are, are joining us for the first time, um, this uh, webinar series is um, a Zoom format. So what that means for you as participants is that we can't see you and you can't speak or, um, or interact with us. So the way that you let us know that you're here, that you give us give feedback to our speakers and we create a bit of a sense of community is to use the chat. Jump onto the chat now, tell, tell us where you're coming to us from. Um, since the pandemic, when we took talking history online, we've had people coming from regional South Australia, from, from interstate and overseas. We've had an amazing reach uh, for these talks. So I'd love to, love to know where you're from. When you're in the chat, just make sure when you are chatting, you have chosen the, the little, there's a little drop down list um, where you're chatting to everyone. You can just talk to us, the hosts and the panelists if you like, but actually it's really nice if everyone gets to see um, what you're reading. Look, and we export the chat at the end of the session so that our speakers, our panelists can, can read all of your lovely comments. Um, it's sometimes it's really hard talking into the void of a computer when you can't see your audience, you can't read the room. So it's really lovely to, to get that feedback and that sense of community in the chat. So please use that. Um, the, the session will go for about 45 minutes tonight. Uh, we will have Keith Conlon and then Kirby Fenwick speaking to us. At the end, we'll take questions from, from the group. So again, please don't put your questions in the chat. There's a little Q&A function down the bottom of your screen. Put your questions for Keith and Kirby in there. Um, if you put them in the chat, by the time we get to questions at the 45 minute mark, uh, they'll be well and truly buried. We, we won't see them. Um, so the Q&A function allows us to, to monitor those questions. So please do that. Um, if you haven't already, jump on the chat, tell us where you're from. Um, and we will get started. Um, just also, just I guess, to let you know, we do record these sessions and we do put them up on our SoundCloud and our YouTube channels. Uh, the chat, the Q&A, the written uh, responses are not part of that recording. So please feel free to ask anything you like. Um, okay. I think we've still got a few people joining, but we will get started just because we are at time. Um, so tonight we're looking at South Australia's long love affair with sport. Uh, for over 180 years, sporting clubs and associations around the state have provided an outlet for physical activity, um, a sense of community and a place to come together. Uh, we've excelled in international, national and local arenas, and we've, we've seen that recently with the Olympics and the amazing results we got there. Um, but sport is not just for the professionals. So apparently in 2013, there was a report that told us two thirds of act uh, two thirds of us actively participate in some form of sport or recreation. It's a significant amount of the population. Um, so we're really, really lucky tonight to have both Keith Conlon and Kirby Fenwick here 
uh, to, to tell us some more and help us um, through this deep dive into South Australia's love affair with sport. So Keith will take us on a tour of some of the great moments in Australian South Australian sporting history with a particular nod to the SANFL Football History Committee, where he's been active, really active in preserving our history and working on an upcoming exhibition for the 145th anniversary of the SANFL. Uh, and then Kirby will introduce us to a woman we should all know. And I have to admit, I didn't know this woman. So I've gone off, I've gone down my own rabbit hole of research. But in 1937, the, the trailblazing South Australian sports journalist, Lois Quarrell, wrote that few girls are content to be mere spectators. Um, and apparently Kirby could have been talking, oh, sorry, um, she could have, Lo Lois could have been talking about herself. Um, a meticulous reporter, a passionate advocate and a champion administrator, Quarrel's contribution to sport and sports journalism in Australia is notable in and in many ways groundbreaking. Um, so that's tonight. Uh, we've got an awful lot of content, some really amazing um, historical photos to show you. Um, so let's sprint through these highlights and these personalities in these places. So I'm going to now introduce you to our first speaker, Mr. Keith Conlon known to many of you as Mr. South Australia. Keith is a retired, retired veteran of radio and TV current affairs and magazine programs in Adelaide. He's been chair of the Heritage Council of South Australia since April 2018. And his keen interest in our heritage sees him contributing to History Trust of South Australia programs all the time. And we're so, uh, so immensely grateful and lucky to, to have Keith as one of our champions. Um, and, in, and he works on the SNFL Football History Committee. He also continues to support several community organisations and lead regular history focused tours around Adelaide on his trusty Treadley. And if you haven't seen any of his, his social media posts on that, you should get online and, and check out um, those photos. That's brilliant. Um, so listen, I'm going to hand over to Keith now to, to start this journey into South Australia's relationship and love affair with sport. Thank you, Keith. Thanks very much, Christy. A bit cold for a bike ride tonight, so we're, we're safely ensconced uh, on Zoom together. Um, a disclaimer first, that this is not a history lecture, uh, uh, but it is um, a melting pot of four of my personal passions, and I think many of you, you would share them. It's history and heritage and sport and old pictures, and they're all coming together tonight. Um, I, I've been looking at pictures uh, for probably 60 years or so. I sort of got the bug early. And there was a time, of course, when you had to go to the library to do it or you, you bought books, you know, like Colonial Life in South Australia, and that sort of whetted my appetite. Now, of course, we, we do it from home. Almost all of the pictures you've, you'll see tonight have, have been sorted from three collections, actually. Um, the the well-known State Library collection, just fabulous collection of, of stuff and really accessible. Uh, and then uh, the Glass Neg collection, as we call it, it's now the History South Australia collection run by the History Trust. All those old government pictures, they're fantastic and a few of them pop up. And then there's the third group, the, the South Australian National Football League archive collection. I'll tell you a little bit more about that later, but they're the three groups. And uh, as, as Christy said, I'm, I'm a volunteer, um, like many of us are in history organisations. And um, so I've sort of got a Guernsey in part tonight, I guess, because I have got a, a job, so to speak, in that field. Um, it's an archive, not a museum, that the SANFL uh, runs through our history committee. Uh, but we did do a big exhibition for the 140th anniversary of the South Australian Footy League, um, which started in 1877. So that's four years ago now. Here's how it started. Adelaide in 1860 saw two very different moments in its history. The first footy team was formed, the Adelaide Football Club. And it was also the year when the Institute was constructed on North Terrace. It's our oldest cultural building. The game and the fine building finally came together with an extremely popular result in 2017. Now part of the State Library of South Australia, the Institute housed the Football History Exhibition in a league of its own, celebrating 140 years of Sandfall. Yeah, so that's how the documentary began and it ran for about 20 minutes. And you can actually see it if you sort of search something like Sandfall History Exhibition, anything like that will probably pop it up on YouTube for you. 
Uh, that was a kind of general smorgasbord of everything that had been collected. Today, of course, we can only visit a, a handful of heritage places. So I plucked some pictures and stories that I hope broadly illustrate just how much sport is part of our culture and part of our heritage that tells us much more than who won at the end of the day. It's also illustrative of big themes and eras in our past. So where are we going to start? Well, predictably, you'd have to start at probably the, the biggest symbol of all sport, the Adelaide Oval in just over the, the River Torrens uh, in the city. Um, this is the 150th year of um, the um, SACA, South Australian Cricket Association. They, they were born at a meeting 150 years ago in uh, the Prince Alfred Hotel, which is now part of the Adelaide Town Hall, got the lease to that section of parklands back in 1871. And so the first picture that we're going to see is really from not very long after that. In 1874, it's pretty remarkable, really. There, there, there you can see the picture. There's a cricket uh, game happening. And it actually doesn't tell you why it's so important. But if you put it together, the, the people who know their cricket history will say, oh, the 22 that played for South Australia when the great W.G. Grace, the great English cricketer, came with his English 11. We still lost the game despite those numbers. But it does portray that already it's a cricket ground. Uh, now, we're going to move on from that to, um, uh, to a, just a broader picture. You can see that it's still very much park lands. But in its time, that ground, long before it became the, the sort of celebrated place of today, it had a a switch back down one end, a sort of a, a roller coaster down by the Torrens. It had a cycling track around it. Uh, it, it. It actually had a game under lights, would you believe, a footy game in 1885 under lights. Now, we didn't have a power plant at that stage, so it was done by steam engine generators, and uh, there were all sorts of problems on the night, and the, the, the colour wore off the footy, it, the white footy didn't last and so on. Perhaps one of the most significant and one that needs a lot more work is that there was a big corroboree in 1885 on this ground you're looking at. Hundreds of people came in, Aboriginal people came in from two big missions and they organised it. It was in, in cooperation with SACA. They organised the content and 21,000 people turned up on the first of two nights. Uh, as I say, that, that deserves um, someone going back to and doing more on its significance. And there'll be debate about, you know, whether we should be seeing it as uh, a, a positive thing or a negative thing, but it was big. Uh, now let's go to the, 20th, uh, the to the 20th century, just into the 20th century. This is the Duke of York. This is the bloke who became King George V. He's on the mound at Adelaide Oval. He's planting one of those fig trees that we sit under. In this case, it was a Port Jackson fig tree and the Duchess planted one next door down towards the member stand end. So they're 120 years old. It's remarkable, really. He was on his way back from opening the federal parliament and predictably there was a big show of force on the Adelaide Oval for him and he did a lot of other things while he was in town. Um, there, there is a rumour, by the way, that the trees were planted at that end because, as you saw in the previous photo, you could sit up on Montefiore Hill and see the game for nothing. Not anymore. Uh, now to our, our next picture, which is one of the great state heritage places for sporting fans. The old school board is about to celebrate its 110th birthday. It was first used in November of 1911, designed by a prominent architect of the time, Kenneth Milne. That's a footy crowd at a final a few years later. Uh, footy crowds have been big at the Adelaide Oval. They were massive for many, many years before the great schism happened, which we'll come to in a moment. Uh, now let's head for um, uh, a diversion. Uh, what are we? Oh, <laughs> yes. And that's a great prop, isn't it? This is 1915. It's a horse tram. It's on the Adelaide Oval. Now, the horse tram stopped about 1908. So what's it doing there? Well, let's go to the second one, and we'll see that there were actually two horse trams. This was a big patriotic carnival. This is, uh, interestingly, they called it Anzac Day, but it was in October on Eight Hours Day. It's, 2000, uh, it's 1915, remember. Gallipoli has only happened. The, 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 the Australian troops have only landed back in April of this year. So by October, they're holding a big fundraising patriotic carnival. What did they do with the trams? They actually ran them together on tracks and then ignited the, the explosives inside. So exploding trams on the Adelaide Oval for a great cause. 
we'll, we'll take a diversion while we're in wartime, in the first war. This is a picture of the Unley Oval with an army tank, obviously an army tank. And again, this is by the end of the war, 1918, uh, the sport and patriotism and war were coming together. There were a couple of tanks that visited lots of ovals and it was all part of raising more funds. There it is, crushing a wall, as the newspaper reports said at the time. Not a dirty great big wall, but you. It, I, I was trying to come up with something about playing at centre-half back, but uh, I haven't succeeded as yet. You might want to add a headline for me of the tank as it goes over the over the wall at centre-half back. Uh, let's go back now um, to... Um, Oh, yeah, we're in 1936. Of course, the Adelaide Oval now becomes part of the celebrations of the centenary of the colony of South Australia. A massive number of kids out there, aren't there? It was just huge. And there are lots of pictures of that centenary event. And if we can, we can see a couple more as we go through. And then we come to a, a game, which was um, a women's football game. You could, uh, clearly, women's footy being played. It's part of um, an event that uh, was, again, um, the fundraising. It was all about fundraising still. Now, this might, it's a, you can see it's a pretty sort of, it's the only picture we've got, but, so we, we, we love it. Um, it may be the game where the Moores Department girls played the Mirror Pajama Factory. I can't quite place which one. I, I read that there was a game and this might have been it. Um, 1921, um, in a Western Australian newspaper, a WA newspaper. I found this uh, just in the last couple of days. This is a picture of the Maylands Norwood girls footy team. So not the Moors team, but um, th it raises the question, was there a local league for a while or did they simply play again these sort of patriotic games or fundraising games? Uh, back to the Adelaide Oval um, and to all... Oh, Oh yeah, there's another. Now that's the Moors team. You can see you can see the names on on, on the jumpers, and it's, it was it was headlined Lemon Time. You know, I, I thought it was Orange Time at three quarter time, but no, the girls are sucking on lemons. It is alleged. Uh, now we go back to the Adelaide Oval, and the, the the site really of a major diplomatic row. Now I'm pretty sure this is a picture from the probably the second day of the test in Adelaide during the Bodyline series of 1932-1933. And you don't have to be a cricket fan to know that it turned into not just a cricket game, but a, a big diplomatic incident. Um, if you haven't been following cricket, the Bodyline was a technique devised by the English captain. And it basically, something they all use today all the time, but it was to bowl really right up short and high to the body of the player. It was really a sort of an anti-Bradman move that invented before that came out for this series. And it had, things had been growing over the first uh, tests interstate. By the time they got to Adelaide, there was a lot of tension and there was real ill feeling. And a massive crowd of 50,000 turned up for the second day when Australia was going to go into bat, including Bradman. And it, it got to the point where there were, there were fears that this crowd was going to jump the fence and um, there were cables back to the MCC in London. There were, uh, there were just you know, really harsh discussions happening on the field and off the field. And it said that basically it soured relations. This game and the tactics in this game or this series actually soured relations with Britain and they were only repaired when uh, the Second World War began in 1939. So more than a game. Oh, we've suddenly got back to 1936 briefly. Um, but let's go on to the next picture, which is, yeah, more of those. Oh, this, uh, just go back a bit. You, it's, it's racing away from, from Catherine who's running the thing. If you just back up a bit, that one, oh, that picture is uh, of one of the uniforms worn on the centenary uh, in 1936. Uh, and the, uh, that's, it's listed as a snowflake. I reckon it might be a snow drop because there were gum nut and wattle dresses worn by some of the little girls as well. The, the, the boys were thing on the, the other side is the Raj and they're out there somewhere. Uh, we're in 1936 at that huge um, uh, centennial event. Uh, now to, um, oh, we, we, through the great schism now because we're jumping from the Adelaide Oval to, as you can see, close to the sea. 
talk about soured relations, relations between the SACA, Cricket Association, and the football, the Sandpool, SANFL, became so bad over who got what and when and who managed the schedule and all that, that um, the, eventually the, the, the footy league said, we're up and out of here, and they headed for the beach. They went to uh, what was the future suburb of West Lakes. And you can see the, the ground, the Westlake Stadium being built. So it's probably a 1973 aerial shot from the uh, Sandpool History Centre uh, uh, picture collection. There are several thousand pictures, by the way, and a lot of footy park in construction and in the first years. And um, so the whole history of football moves from the Adelaide Oval, whence it began, and that's the 1860 picture. That's the 1860 Adelaide Football Club, probably a few years on. But that was tucked away in the Sandville headquarters, which was at Footy Park. But it wasn't, um, shall we say, catalogued. It wasn't an archive in the sense that uh, somebody knew where everything was. Luckily, um, it got saved. And that's the story of that is uh, effectively told in the, in, in the documentary there. But we're talking about a lot of material. If we just roll on, Catherine, we'll see the sorts of things that came out of that. Now, in the collection, this is my favourite piece of the collection. Not the best bit, not the most expensive bit, but it is a dunny seat. And it was painted by, as you can see, this is a little excerpt from the documentary, painted by John Dynan, one of the outback artists up uh, in Broken Hill, and presented to the great Barry Robram, arguably if not the best player of the 20th century, one of a handful of the very best, a brilliant player and loved by all, including the opposition. And included, uh, and, and uh, that included a, a lot of love from uh, John Dynan. And so <laughs> we're very lucky that Barry and his wife donated the Dunny seat to the collection. Uh, the, the medals are an important part of anything, they're, they're of, of, of footy, wherever, wherever it's played. And there used to be, um, a, the, the McGarry medals were not collected together. They were mostly within families and so on. And mercifully in latter years, it's been a, a personal project of Chris, Christine Halbert to gather them together. We've got all but six of them now, would you believe? And some of them are replicas because the family had liked to keep it. Um, but, and all of them were from, from the beginning, 1898, right up to uh, 1991, Every year, a different medal was made by um, the local jeweller who did it for many years. So they're, they're actually works of art and they tell stories, lovely stories. Um, Albie Green, the bloke who won the first one in 1898, he used to, he used to ride down to the Unley Oval to play from Wollonga on his horse. Then there's the one that was won by uh, the, um, uh, the, the Norwood uh, uh, star who disappeared. He just, he just, disappeared from off the face of the earth. In fact, to this day, the Norwood footy historians don't really know what happened to him. His medal popped up. He won it about 1900-ish, uh, and his medal popped up about 30 years later in a Melbourne um, pawn shop and was bought with what such serendipity, bought by uh, a club uh, his, history type and, and given to the club, and so now it's, it's in the collection. Let's move on from um, those bits of footy. Oh, this represents probably the biggest crowd, in fact, certainly the biggest crowd ever to go to a Sandful Grand Final. It's the 1976 Grand Final. That's the Jumbo Prince, as it was known to Sturt fans, taking a mark. Sturt won the game over Port. But what's really important is have a look at the crowd in the background. A lot of those people are sitting on the grass. So the, the allegedly biggest crowd uh, is... Um, registered somewhere, I'm trying to find it, because it, but it doesn't really matter. 66,900 and something, but really many people think there might have been 70 or 80,000 in the uh, Oval because as Lee Wicker, who was the, then the, the boss of the, uh, the league, right, ran the league, the chief exec, he said, the cops would tell us to shut the gate down one end, but there was only people up the other who wanted to get in that would let them in for a while. And so we'd ne we will never know exactly how many people were at the 1976 grand final. Uh, let's go on to R. Ah, we go from that big picture, big events, and 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 that that schism that was only solved um, in 2014 when the footy came back to Adelaide Oval. We go to a small and lost but not forgotten heritage and history treasure, the Gilberton Swimming Pool. 
This is 1915 when the pool is developed basically by the local citizens. One fellow in particular, uh, he started it um, because he was afraid that more kids were going to die swimming in the water holes. There was one further downstream a bit by the Hackney Bridge was actually called the dead hole. So these pictures show you that manicured grandstand, so to speak, on one side, all dug out by volunteers with pick and shovel. And then the events went on and they, they ran until the 1950s. Like this swimming pool looks a bit like a water hole, doesn't it? This, this swimming pool actually held an Australian championship in the 1920s. And there's a, a lovely 1936 uh, centenary arch, which also celebrates the work of Percy Jervis and the thousands of kids that learned to swim for nothing through the Gilbert swimming pool. Let, let's go grand again to the Victoria Park race course. And it's a symbol not only of racing being really big in the 19th century, big crowds at Victoria Park to the point where they've built the grandstand that you can see. That's only a, the first half of it, which was built in the 1880s. Uh, then there's another bit was added on in, uh, around the turn of the century. It shows you that, but I guess it also shows you that the city council who built it were, were pretty flush at the time. The 80s was a boom period for South Australia and therefore for the capital city, Adelaide, and it shows up in a lot of buildings that we really enjoyed, the sort of high Victorian era, including a grandstand in the middle of the park that no longer sees races but is used in all sorts of other ways. I used to run around it, um, up and down it doing physical jerks, but there you can you can have a, co a coffee out the front there now. There's a, a cafe downstairs, um, the, the Velo Precinct. There's a uh, polo played out the front of it. There are uh, cycling, cycling goes on all day, every day, walkers, runners. Uh, it's a multi-use facility out the front of the grandstand, thanks to the city council. Now we're going to go um, back again to... Um, something that's lost but not forgotten, a really a place I, I just love the sense of this. This is the Jubilee Oval. Now, we can work out where it is if we look at what's in the background of what is a royal show parade of cattle in the foreground. If you have a look along that skyline, it's a bit faded, but you can see that there's a church-like structure just sort of middle right. Oh, well done. There it is, Catherine. Thank you. That's the Alder Hall on North Terrace. Then slightly left of that, the domed building, that's the exhibition building, the long lost and long lamented lost building, the exhibition building built in the 1880s for an international exhibition. We thought, oh, you know, Paris can do it uh, and um, Britain, can, London can do it. Why not us? Melbourne did it, of course. And again, it's a sign of the great prosperity of the 1880s and of the Royal Show being there. It was there from, there. there's a better picture where you can sit, so, so, certainly see the background. Uh, the show was on in the city until 1924 and the government realising that they needed the showground for uh, expanding things like the university. Uh, and so the show was a bit worried that they were going a hell of a long way out of town because the government had bought a farm at Wayville. Naturally, things had gone well until COVID came along. The Jubilee Oval, uh, th this... To me, this is the kind of anachronism in a way, but the two come together strangely. That's the new Barsmith Library in the background, looking all Georgian with a bit of a, but a, a bit of a classical touch with the columns in the front. And then in the front of them, in the front of the library, which is just finished, it's 1932. In that year, there was a 75th anniversary rodeo for Sir Sidney Kidman. So this is a whole lot of stockmen who've come down from the far north and they've been demonstrating and each crowd turned up. Uh, and so you've got, on the one hand, you've got stockmen who produce the wealth for the pastoralists. And in the back, you've got what happens when the pastoralists give a great deal of money to the University of Adelaide. That's the Bar Smith Library. And the Smith is as in Elder Smith. So the, it's a lovely sort of connection in a way. That Rodeo, by the way, was, was a dangerous affair. would not quite pass uh, car, uh, pass occupation of health and safety. So many people turned up, they all jumped the fence, but they were doing things like, you know, bringing down calves and chasing bulls around and the, the crowd somehow miraculously parted. Sadly, one lad did die that day. He fell off the roof trying to get a better view. So let's move on to our next. Oh, then the Jubilee Oval turns into the site for the Spanish flu quarantine camp. Here we are. A century on with all the same issues as are demonstrated here. 
There's even a train in the front to tell us that the hundreds of people out there in tents that are in quarantine, they haven't got the Spanish flu, they're in the quarantine because they were stuck in Melbourne. They had the same problems as today, and they persuaded the government eventually to put on a giant Melbourne Express, so to speak. It was so long, it had several hundred people on board, they had to split it in two at Murray Bridge in order to get it up and over the hills and down into Adelaide and all the way through on a railway line that served the exhibition ground or, or the Jubilee Oval. Uh, and uh, so here they lived. Uh, and there were all sorts of problems, as there are with quarantine today. People were chucking fruit in to help them out, trying to, people were trying to escape. On, on the Generally, it seems like they had a good time. Like, here's the women's cricket team. For, during the quarantine care. And generally, um, mercifully, um, we suffered less than other states. The exhibition building itself was run by Matron Graham for a whole year. It was the ward where people who did get Spanish flu were kept um, and we hoped they'd survive. We lost over 500 people, which would be the equivalent of probably, um, you'd multiply that by four at least to get to the, the pro rata event today. Whereas um, there were more like 15,000 people lost um, around the nation and it struck so quickly. It was a dreadful, dreadful um, um, uh, pandemic. We're gonna finish with um, another picture, which is just gorgeous. It is a patriotic game on the Jubilee Oval and it is girls who are playing in a game of footy, obviously. This might be, um, Oh, no, this is the, 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 how are the girls, how do the teams get sorted? This was north of the GPO versus south of the GPO. Don't ask me how I got into it, because I've got some figures just to illustrate how this was a, this was a very early forerunner of what is magically happening today. Well, it's not magically happening, it's happening through the work of thousands and thousands of volunteers as well. But these girls were the forerunners of the, I've just got the numbers out today, thanks to uh, the Sandful. There are now um, 5,100 registered women players. And as well as that, there are another 1,900 Auskick junior women players. There are now um, 342 footy teams in South Australia, women's footy teams. Then you just wonder, don't you? Because the opportunities are now fantastic to find the next Aaron Phillips, the next Noffy. Was there one out here playing in this patriotic game in 1918 that could have gone on with it, if only there was a women's league? It's a nice place for me to end because I know that Kirby has written uh, an award-winning audio documentary about women's footy. Oh, brilliant. Thank you very much, Keith. That was um, some amazing, lovely photos. I'm I've made a few notes to pick your brain about those archives uh, later. Um, just a reminder to everyone, put your questions in the Q&A for Keith and Kirby, and we will address them at the end of tonight's session. Um, so that is a really nice segue to, to Kirby Fenwick, who I'm going to introduce to you now. Kirby is a writer and an audio producer from Melbourne, living on the lands of the Wurundjeri people. Um, so you're in lockdown, Kirby, is that correct? At the yes. moment, yes. Uh, welcome from Melbourne. Um, we've got, I, I mean, well, you may or may not be pleased to know there are some people in the audience tonight joining you from Melbourne as well. So welcome to uh, anyone from Victoria, ACT, Queensland, you know, New South Wales. Um, welcome tonight. Um, so Kirby is co-founder of Siren, a woman, uh, a woman in sport collective and has written for The Guardian. Eureka Street and Melbourne City of Literature, amongst many others. And her audio documentary, The First Friday in February, which tells the story of the very first AFLW game, was awarded the 2018 Oral History Victoria Award, uh, which is fabulous. So Kirby um, is here to talk to us tonight about that 1937 trailblazing South Australian sports journalist, Lewis Quarrel, whose quote I love. I'm going to use that again and again. I'm just going to pull that one out a few times. But a few girls, few girls are content to be mere spectators. And clearly, if we now have, like what Keith said, 342 women's footy teams, amazing, amazing stuff. So Kirby, over to you to continue our journey tonight. Thank you very much. Uh, I like to imagine that there was definitely an Aaron Phillips or a Noffy playing on that game, Keith, for sure. Um, let me just bring this up. I hope you can all see that. 
Um, yeah, so I'll be talking to you tonight about Lois Quarrell, who is somebody that I only discovered in the last couple of years, but have fast, um, I don't want to say become obsessed with, but I, I respect her a lot and I'm, I'm always very interested in reading her work and I'm really excited to share some of it with you tonight. So Lois was South Australia's first woman sports journalist and she really did uh, blaze a trail for women in sport, both on the field and off it. Her contribution to sport and sports journalism in Australia is absolutely groundbreaking. It's history making. She was working as a sports journalist at a time when the number of women doing so could be counted on one hand and you wouldn't even need the whole hand. So, so who, uh, who is Lois Quarrell? This is Lois. The photo on the left was taken in the 1930s at a women's life-saving event and the one on the right was taken in 1970 on her semi-retirement. She was born in Adelaide in 1914 and her love for sport was evident early. In high school she played cricket, hockey, basketball. It's likely the basketball she was playing was actually netball but we'll leave that quirk of sporting history for another day. Um, that Lois actually played sport herself, I think, is a really interesting part of her story because some of those who have written about her have suggested that one of the reasons that she was so successful in her role was because she wasn't an outsider sort of looking in, but she was an outside, she was an insider, sorry, taking news and stories from her own community to a wider audience, which I think is a very interesting point when we think about the coverage of women's sport today, but I digress back to Lois. Uh, so she joined the advertiser in 1932 and initially worked as a typist, but it wouldn't be long before she was moved from the commercial department to the editorial and the impetus for the shift, well, sport, of course. In 1935, Lois joined a women's life-saving squad and she began writing a column for the advertiser about women's life-saving. That's actually her at the front of that photo. Um, that's pretty cool. Uh, and it was this work that led her to landing her job covering women's sport for the advertiser. And on Friday, May the 1st, 1936, Lois Quarrell's women's sport page was launched. And that first page featured stories on basketball and cricket, hockey, table tennis, badminton, lacrosse, athletics, and even aviation. And this diversity of sports really reflected Lois's interest in, in a range of sports and it would be a continuing theme of her work, uh, no sport seemingly too niche. And the first page, this first page demonstrated too that she wasn't just interested in women who made it to state or national teams because local competitions featured heavily and would continue to do so. One of my favourite things about that first page is the story that sits at the centre increase in women's interest in sport Adelaide's athletic Amazons it's a nice bit of alliteration she mentions the five women selected for the 1936 games in Berlin and that Australian women who had excelled in all branches of sport would travel to Germany America and England in the next year and she also wrote during the last five years the growth and development of women's sport has been meteoric Fresh fields, hitherto as sacred to men, have been explored and conquered by women, and the public, from being mildly amused and tolerant, is today impressed by the high standard of play attained. She was only, Lois was only 21 when she wrote this first women's sport page, but it really set the tone for the next three decades of reporting. She did, and she was going to take women and their sport seriously. She very quickly established a reputation for being a meticulous reporter and incredibly accurate. In an article published in the Journal of the Historical Society of South Australia, P.A. Howe writes that her work was never queried or questioned, and in fact, in the same article, an apprentice of Lois's said that every other Australian daily paper paid Lois the compliment of reproducing verbatim her reports on interstate contests held in Adelaide. Her reporting just unapologetically celebrated women's sporting achievements and spoke directly to that growth that she mentioned in the first, first page. And the point about women, about Lois taking women's sports seriously is an important one to make because when she took on this role in 1936, the landscape for women's sport was changing, but there was still plenty of people who were opposed to women competing or had some very, shall we say, conservative ideas around what women's sport should look like. Case in point with these pretty interesting comments by Paul Gallico, a well-known American sports commentator at the time. 
Lois quotes him at length, and I like to think she does that to demonstrate how ridiculous his ideas were. Um, and she, she called his article scathing and so that his comments had caused a sensational stir among the fair sex. I, I won't go through exactly um, what he says, but just briefly um, of some 25 sports in which women today indulge publicly with feminence and passion, there are very few in which they do not manage to look utterly silly. Women think they look beautiful and graceful playing tennis, but they do not. The girl has yet to be built who can run attractively. On the court, she is just about as elegant as a giraffe. He goes on to suggest that sports like basketball, badminton and fencing, swimming and rowing were inappropriate for women. Safe to say Lois disagreed with him and she wraps up her report of his comments with a single sentence. It may be safely said that Mr Gallico will not be allowed to go unchallenged. And one of the ways women and Lois herself challenged these sort of ideas was through the creation of their own sporting associations throughout the early part of the 20th century. Sports like cricket, hockey, basketball, rowing, women were organising and administering their own sports. And this is something that Lois really supported and advocated in an article in November 1938 about the challenges faced by the Adelaide Women's Amateur Athletic Club. She wrote, until the women make an attempt to control their own affairs and be self-supporting, little progress will be made. I cannot disagree with her. But she did more than advocate. She was actively involved in helping to form some of these associations. In 1938, she was involved in creating the South Australian Women's Amateur Swimming Association, and she served there uh, as secretary for a decade. And in 1941, she encouraged the creation of the South Australian Amateur Athletics Association. And in 1953, she was involved in forming the South Australian Women's Amateur Sports Council, a council she would later go on to be president of. Um, but advocating for women to take charge of their own sporting pursuits and challenging some interesting ideas about women and women's sport were the only things on Lois's agenda. She also often used her page to champion the causes of women's sport. In an article in uh, July 1938, she wrote about the push for better facilities for women's hockey and basketball. South Australian sportswomen, she said, who for so long have had to take second place to men in the sporting field are at last beginning to assert themselves. She goes on to quote Marjorie Pollard, an English cricketer and field hockey player and the first woman to commentate sport for BBC. Among men, there is a sublime ignorance and a naive blindness to the fact that women and girls play games at all or that they have any desire to do so. In all public recreation grounds, there is provision for men, but the same cannot be said about provision for women. Where grounds are available, there is often no dressing accommodation. There are many places throughout England where strenuous games are played and the players actually have to hang their coats on hedges. Lois addresses this, this issue of dressing accommodation for South Australian women, and she says that South Australian sports girls cannot even boast of protective hedges around their sports field, and the majority have no club sheds. And she talks about how the women playing are often young on low wages. They just don't have the means to pay for their own, the building of their own playing sheds. And I think what she's doing here, what I like to think she's doing here is pointing to the very specific challenges faced by women who wanted to play sport. It wasn't just the social and cultural stuff. It was really practical things like just having access to a ground or to some changing rooms. Um, and I think this, um, this, her taking women's sport seriously also extended to the sort of language that she used when she was talking about them playing. So we have some examples of her when talking about a cricket match, she's she's describing the forceful batting displays and smart play. And when she's talking about a basketball game, she's saying that the team were outstanding for its sure and clean passing, superior marking, accurate goaling and teamwork. And reporting on an interstate hockey match, she describes the player as unequaled for speed and accurate shooting. And we can see some more examples of this in a report on the basketballers selected to represent South Australia, remembering these basketballers are netballers. Um, she firstly describes the players by their local club and position, and then goes on to describe them as having an outstanding record for accuracy and being at the top of her form or an excellent mark and very quick on her feet, playing a level-headed defence game and an ex excellent fighting player. And it wasn't just the women playing sport who caught Lois's eye. She often highlighted women administrators and umpires too. 
This example from 1936 is the profile of Lorna Ryan, the popular president of the South Australian Umpires Association. Lois describes her extensive experience and writes that the growing popularity of the sport in this state can be attributed in a large measure to her enthusiasm. And in keeping with her work to encourage women to take charge of their own sport and to challenge interesting ideas about women's sport, Lois also lent her voice to the campaign for rational dress. It, this was a feminist movement which advocated for changes in women's clothing that would support freedom of movement and practicality, which is very necessary when you're playing sport. In 19, this was in 1937 and Lois wrote, the first step towards the establishment of sensible sports costumes for women and the subsequent appearance of shorts was made in the middle of the 19th century when a gallant band of feminists led by Elizabeth Smith Miller introduced a daring costume consisting of a short skirt with loose trousers gathered around the ankle. The whole world was shocked for in those days it was considered the height of indiscretion for a woman to let the public know she possessed legs. It is to these pioneers that we owe our present freedom and comfort in dress. The modern sports girl with her business-like shorts, abbreviated swimming suits and healthy outlook on life is a person to be envied, not criticised. I really love that line about um, letting the public know that she possessed legs. Um, I think Lois was actually quite funny. So <laughs> I think that's a really lovely insight into who she was as a person. And really from the very first article that Lois wrote for the advertiser in 1935, the launch of her women's sport pages and throughout the three decades that followed, she worked consistently on the page and behind the scenes to nurture and encourage and support and celebrate women's sport and women in sport in South Australia and around the country and internationally, in fact. She was meticulous, she was diligent, she was accurate, prompt, she was funny. And she wrote thousands of articles. The, um, the paper that I mentioned earlier written by PA House suggests the number is something like 22,000 and I would not be surprised. Um, she wrote all sorts of things, articles, uh, match and comp reports, profiles, what we call op-eds. And every time she was championing women, championing women and women in sport. And I think the story of Lois um, has a lot of relevance today, not only because I think she was a fascinating woman and deserves recognition for everything that she did, but also because of the sort of contrast between what she was doing and, and the story of women's sport. So if you think about um, today, women's sport coverage today, um, we know that it barely reaches more than 10% of major mainstream sports coverage. There is study after study, paper after paper um, to back this up. Um, and, you know, Lois was doing something really incredible, I think and something really remarkable. I mean, can you imagine opening a major daily newspaper today and just seeing a full page or two pages or three pages dedicated to women's sport? It is so rare that when we see it, we get really excited. Uh, so in 1970, Lois actually semi-retired from the advertiser. She did continue to contribute to the advertiser sports coverage, uh, writing articles on women's golf, here she is playing golf, and lawn bowls, two sports she herself had taken up. She fully retired in 1977, although she continued to be a part of the sporting landscape in South Australia, uh, and she, she died in 1991. So as um, was mentioned by Christy at the start, in 1937, Lois wrote that few girls are content to be mere spectators and she was absolutely talking as much about herself as anyone else. Um, she wasn't just a, a journalist covering women's sport or sport in South Australia. She really, through her reporting and her advocacy in the pages of the advertiser, she really advanced the cause of women's sport. She championed women athletes from the elite level to the grassroots. She pushed back against those sort of um, social and cultural stuff, those conservative ideas that sought to limit women's access to sport. And she encouraged women to really take control of their own sport. She, she really used her, her, her pages in the advertiser to, to legitimise women's sport and to combat the, the ways in which women's sport were made to feel inferior. There is, there's so much about Lois and her work that I haven't covered today thousands and thousands of stories, um, you know, moments in the history of, of women's sport in South Australia. But if you're interested, I really encourage you to look up the article here from PA Howe. I really encourage you to look up John Daly's book if you can find it. 
you won't be able to see that properly over there with the light. Um, and Trove, um, if you're interested, you can find lots and lots of amazing stories from, from Lois on Trove and um, it's really good reading. I will end that. Oh, oh, excellent. That was so brilliant, Kirby. Um, really, really insightful. I mean, I just, I don't know, I just think what a woman. She used her position and her privilege and she fought, I mean, she was funny, but yes, she was obviously quite brave and quite strong to be, what did you say, some of the, her, one of her, she was only 21 when she wrote that, that piece you were talking about, that first piece. So, that's quite amazing uh, and the way she championed women's sport and she used her position and mm. and she showcased everyone not just the you know like you said the national champions and it was everyone the administrators uh right through to to coaches and umpires yes oh fabulous um oh, that's what i love about history is you, you there are all these amazing stories of these brilliant people who who just we can learn so much from and just change the landscape just bit by bit, slowly, slowly, and um, that we're still discovering these things. And, and you know, yeah, I'm just, yeah, that was fabulous. Uh, look, thank you both. Now, we've got some questions. Um, so I noticed some people have put some questions in the chat as well. Uh, thank you to Catherine, who has been um, copying them across. Uh, so we will... We'll go to the questions. Oh, someone in the chat also said, boo to Mr. Gallagher. And I'm just going to, you know, I'm going to give that an upvote. That's <laughs> Gallagher. Um, listen, now, um, so just because we've just finished with you, Kirby, can I just ask, um, someone's asked a question of, can you expand a bit on your comments about netball being described as basketball and give a bit of a background on this? Uh, I can't give a huge amount of background, to be honest, but um, basically, I think it wasn't until, I'm going to say 1970, but don't quote me on that, that women's netball in Australia was known as basketball. Um, I'm not sure exactly why. I'm sure it's an incredibly interesting story, uh, but it does mean that if you're doing any kind of historical research on netball and or basketball, uh, it really complicates the situation because you're never quite sure what sport they're talking about um but as for the reason i'm i'm actually not 100 percent sure why they called it basketball and so am i right in thinking so you've used trove a lot for your research kirby you um yeah yes. did you notice any um shift in when when those terms were being you know being used and when they were dropped uh, not for the preparation of this um, particular chat because um, unfortunately Trove only goes up to the 1950s. I think it's mid 50s at the moment for the advertisers, so we haven't sort of got that yet. And I can't get to the South Australian State Library to see the archive. <laughs> uh, yes, you're right. Actually, I had just I'd forgotten briefly um, Trove's limitations in terms of the, those time frames. Mm. It is a gold mine, though. I, yeah, it's brilliant. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so while we're just down in the nitty gritty of some of this stuff, Keith, can I ask you about, there's a question, um, which was, can you settle this for, for some of our punters out there, which, which was South Australia's first football team? Was it South Adelaide? Was it someone else? Do you know? <laughs> um, you're on mute, Keith. Ironically, it was called the Adelaide Football Club in 1860, and they were the only club to begin with, so they would play games of north of the Torrens versus south of the Torrens, sometimes in the South Parkland, sometimes in the North Parkland, and then other clubs slowly came together, and, and some of them have disappeared completely. There was a side called the Bankers, and then the, the Medindi Football Club, were also known as, what were they called? I think they called themselves the Dingoes and they became the North Adelaide Football Club. There was a, just to really confuse us, there was a South Australian or an Adelaide side called the Victorians. Um, and these sort of eventually came together in 1877 and said, look, we actually need to get organised here. So the rules were settled, a schedule with like, there was a program for the whole year and that meant you could also have a premier. So that sort of got them organised. But from... From 1860 to 1877, it was all a bit haphazard. We did play some interstate games, though. Oh, brilliant. And just uh, following on, so 
there, there's another detailed question here. And then I think um, I understand, Keith, you might have some questions as well. But so, I mean, you, you showed a lot of really great images of Adelaide Oval, of Jubilee, like the, and, um, you know, the Royal Show, quarantine tents, so many different multi use um, examples of these spaces. Yeah. yeah so, did, how do you know how that impacted on their use as sporting venues? Did, did, you know, what, what happened to the sport while these ovals were taken over for other uses? If they're blowing up trams on Adelaide Oval, I mean, <laughs> what happened to the cricket? <laughs> exactly. That was in October, so the cricket's finished um, and the cricket hasn't started. Uh, that, there you go. That's just pure luck, wasn't it? That, that um, Anzac Day, as they called it, in October was the eight hours day. I reckon it, you know, the footy would have finished the week before and the cricket probably started the week afterwards. But um, And the Jubilee Oval was used by two or three different league sides uh, and I guess they had to juggle with the show. You'd, I'd have to go back and, you know, test, get my Royal Adelaide show history off the wall to say, because at one stage the Royal Show was doing two a year uh, when it was based down in the parklands. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's a good question. Uh, Adelaide Oval still has the same issue, doesn't it? You know, is there going to be a rock concert? Will it be cleaned up in time for a, for a game or something? Um, I guess that's it tells us how central the Adelaide Oval is and how it must still be for the stadium authority that now runs it. It must now be a real juggle. They've at last stopped sort of chucking rocks at each other from their offices, you know, like the footy versus the cricket, and that got really uncomfortable. But now at least there's an authority which has both cricket and football well represented. And I guess it's in both their interests to make it a profitable stadium. That's how you get the Rolling Stones thrown in as well. Yes, and then hopefully we don't have those schisms where, where um, you know, the footy takes off to the beach again. <laughs> that's right. That's right. I don't think that's going to happen this time. Um, <laughs> One of the things, one of the issues about the women's footy season, with all of that, you know, that's even before COVID messed everything up. One of the issues that I think's um, got to be resolved a bit, particularly as now we are moving to the stage where there will be at AFL level, every side will have one. You've got to, you can't afford to be playing that game in January. I can tell you, going to the Norwood Oval in January, as, as uh, my daughter and I have been going to regularly, it's bloody hot. <laughs> so it's it's not fair for, to be playing a high-intensity game like Australian rules uh, in the middle of summer. It doesn't make sense. But uh, the solution is that's much hairier. That is much, much hairier, isn't it? Um, mm. Yes, but it is bloody hot. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, not, I'm just wondering whether you could both talk... I mean, you've both obviously um, delved into archives a lot. You've done a lot of research yourselves. You're very familiar with a lot of the source material. Could you maybe both talk from your perspectives on uh, the challenges of finding this kind of history? I mean, Keith, you were talking about some of the intersections in terms of, you know, industry and the financial state yeah. of, of South Australia and, and these things and how you might be able to track that in these heritage uh, photographs and, and Kirby, the same in terms of, tracing the evolution of, um, you know, uh, conservative, um, the conservative nature of our attitudes towards sport. But, um, yeah, what, what kind of challenges have you faced in finding the history and, and what's the role of archives and volunteers and other groups? Because some of this stuff seems a bit serendipitous in terms of the yeah. way you've found it. You you've know. done some more serious work in this area, Kirby. You go first. <laughs> I don't know about that. Um... Serendipitous is apt because um, Rob Hess, who I think is is listening here, um, actually alerted me to Lois Quarrel and um, yeah. told me I might be interested in that book. Um, yeah, it is hard to find this stuff if you don't have that um, if you don't have that little bit of a tip off, I guess. Um, you know, what are you looking for in Trove? Um, you know, what are you searching for in the archives? I think one of the problems too is that. Um, I guess at the time when people are doing these things and, and writing this stuff and playing these, in, you know, incredible games or sports or what have you, they're probably not thinking about the historic nature of what they're doing. Um, perhaps they were, I don't know. Um, but that maybe means that they don't necessarily preserve everything. Um, and there are, I think women's sport particularly, there are a lot of um, missing stories 
and the challenge is how to find them. I look, um, asking lots and lots of people to talk to you is one thing to do. Um, I think that having more conversations like this as well, encouraging people to maybe you know have a look in their in their shed or in their in their bookcases and see what they might have and they might be able to contribute to the story. I think that's a very good point. We have both on the one hand we have great riches because everybody records things now. We've all got a camera with us, uh, and um, and so there are thousands of images. There are podcasts that people just make them because they can, and that's fantastic. The problem is, though, is getting hold of them and somehow rationalising them. And um, we have an issue at the Sandville History Centre. We know we've got to be recording women's footy in this fantastic explosion, but the women who are doing it are so busy doing it at the moment. It's a bit like most small business people. You ask them about, you know, how's their history going? And they'll say, oh, well, I'll get around to that in a few years' time. So we're, we're sort of encouraging um, uh everybody to do what you're suggesting somehow get hold of it um and that that it, uh, it it doesn't have to be it's not the minutes of the of the league we're worried about it's not the big official stuff although you need that it's the it's those personal diaries isn't it and those more in intimate images it's um you've done some great work just on a game you know the first game it, it, there's so much of that that we can do and i guess in a way the um, having gone from being worried about the explosion, and I am, uh, at the same time, I'm also encouraged by the wonderful young producers and writers and so on who seem to be doing it, getting a hold of it, and we just have to encourage them and particularly encourage them to then come to the State Library, come to the Footy Archive, come to whoever's running it. The History Trust is a great um, advisor in South Australia uh, because I was going to try to make a point somewhere about the role of volunteers um, we we all all of our not all there are some fantastic professional historians thank goodness but much of our really good work at local level is by people uh, who who do it for love and do it really well for love um, and so you know here's the volunteers they keep our culture going they keep our history and our heritage together and um, so I guess we're going to rely on them in the future and hope they're they're better organised than my systems. Oh, absolutely. Here, here. I mean, at the History Trust, we rely so much on volunteers. Their, their passion and their knowledge and the life experience they bring um, is just invaluable. You just you, you, you just really can't put a value on it. Um, I agree. We've got, um, a, we've got an interesting system, by the way, just switching to heritage for a moment. Uh, um, we've got an open system, a state heritage place. It's pretty tough to get it to that level. You've got to satisfy one of the six, seven criteria under the legislation, et cetera. But anyone can apply. Anyone can say that building somehow has missed out or that thing has missed out. It's not just grand old churches and so on. It's really interesting things like the gasworks at Brompton. We only recently put it on and what a revolution that was industrially and, and how much did it impact, impact on the whole of the Western suburbs and the people who work there. That came from um, really um, people there working admittedly with Charles Sturt Council and so on, but volunteers again saying, we'll do, the, we'll do some of the work, we'll get it to a stage where you're going to say, we ho they hope, yep, we're going to go on with it and finish this off and then decide does it meet the criteria. So even at the level of something in, you know, state heritage places going onto the list, volunteers are working again. Mm, yes, and they're, they're often bringing that intimate knowledge from, from yeah. their working lives and from and what matters to them. Yeah. You, remind me, you remind me at the meeting when we were there, it was fantastic to have a couple of the people who represented, um, it was really their, their, their dads in general, had worked at the gasworks, but they lived around the corner in Brompton or Bowdoin, and they said, we knew, you know, we could. We always heard the the whistle, you know, that, that sort of sense of the sound of the suburb was important to them as well as as well as the workplace. Yeah, and I guess that kind of goes to Kirby's point of when you're in the thick of something, you don't realise. I mean, but that so much of what we live through is is really significant in terms of those stories and that history, and we don't think to document it at the time. But you know, when we have time to reflect and a bit of distance, and we can pause, it's it's yeah, it's really important. Um, yes, okay, and, and yeah, and, and in terms of how we uncover more of those women's stories, we've been talking a lot about that in Talking History over the last 
probably two years, a lot of our talks have, that, that have sort of focused in a little bit on, on how you might use the historical photos and read the records differently to find those other voices and those other stories. And, you know, Keith, one, I mean, maybe it's not uncovering a women's story, but that 1976 grand final, that image where you, you say there's the, the official number of the crowd and, and who was there. But yeah. actually, when you actually look at the photo and you look at those anecdotal accounts of the people letting people through the gate, it's, it's, it's quite clear there's probably yeah. a lot more, but, you yeah. know, it's those things. It's um, what's on the official record and then what's actually happening, and that's there's one a, there, of those great things. There's a question on the side from mm. Rob uh, asking about the CSC collection, and, and he's right, it's a great collection within the library. I don't know much about it why it's the CSC collection. I just find myself using it a lot. It just pops up when I'm looking for something. But he did, he, I think he raises a really good question about uh, are we at the South Australian History Centre, are we sort of cross-accessing? And it is something that um, I think it's fair to say, Christy, because you're involved in looking after the glass eggs as well, uh, that um, that we are talking a bit more together, aren't we? And there's, there's, we, there's, we're no longer living in silos it's not perfect yet, but uh, I think the good news is, Rob, we are acknowledging that we've got good stuff and we ought to at least be able to cross-access. Yeah, absolutely, I agree. We just don't quite have the infrastructure and, and the pieces <laughs> underneath. <laughs> <laughs> but we, are, but you're right. Look, that, 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 there's another really good question there too from Janet, who's, who's one of our um, long time, actually a volunteer at the History Trust, a really valued volunteer and long time supporters of the of Talking History and the History Trust. But um, she's got a question about Lois. Um, did she have any proteges or women who yeah. followed and continued her reporting, or was she like Haley's comet? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Thanks. There is mention of an apprentice. Um, she actually came to Melbourne for a couple of years in the late, uh, very late 40s, early 50s. And when she came back to South Australia, took up the, the same role at the advertiser. My understanding is that she had an apprentice um, or a, a cadet journalist, if you will, um, that was working with her. Um, so I assume um, that woman sort of took on a little bit of that. There are some resources that are mentioned in that um, in that article that I that I included, uh, and I think there might be some more information about that in there. So um, hopefully, a trip on uh, to South Australia is on the cards at some point, so I can have a look. But um, yeah, I'm not sure if there was anyone that was sort of like directly following her. Um, yeah, and I mean, I think um, the situation of, of, of around women's sport coverage today would perhaps suggest that um, we may have regressed a little bit uh, since Lois's time. We've, we've got a, a new situation with newspapers now of sort of double whammy. The, the, uh, the, the revenue stream of advertising is gone and therefore there are fewer staff members. And you'd reckon that sadly then they start looking at which what's getting more clicks and so we need another Lois. Yeah, I think we, <laughs> I think we need more than one. Yes. <laughs> Uh, we do. We need lots of Lois. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, Kirby, I'm, I'm curious. So, um, do you play sport yourself? Because I'm just, uh, you know, just reflecting on some of this conversation and, oh, and great, someone's just put in a link to the CSC collection at State Library. Kirby, do you play sports yourself? Um, I did play for, uh, Aussie Rules football for a couple of years, mm -hmm. um, inspired by the AFLW. Took that up in my early 30s. Um, <laughs> So that's my sort of, um, that's my playing history. Brilliant. Wow. That's, um, yeah, most people's bodies are starting to hurt. By <laughs> that's impressive. <laughs> I just I just wonder whether we'll look back in 20, 30 years and, and look at the path that you're pioneering too for, for women's sport, actually. Um, you might not be able to see it right now, but I think you're doing some amazing work. Um, that's really, really important. So on that note, I just realised we are we're probably at time. Uh, but whether there's anything, Keith or Kirby, you feel you haven't had a chance to add, or and we will once we've um, edited the recording, we'll send this around to everyone who's here tonight and those who've registered who haven't been able to get on. I think there's been a little bit of trouble with some people um, accessing. Um, and we will give people the links to Keith's image list. People want that. We will absolutely provide some extra resources for people. But is there is there anything that you, any parting words or, or any stories that you wanted to share before we break off tonight? 
I picked up a couple of things like just on the side. Uh, it's always wonderful. It's a bit like a, a walking tour. You always learn something. And um, uh, who was it who said uh, it was Craig who said, guess who won the 1885 game under lights? <laughs> it was South Adelaide. And he hopes they do it again this Friday night. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be under lights again. And then there was a, a nice comment. We were talking about netball and basketball. And, they, and we, as soon as they said that, I thought, yeah, we didn't call it netball. And uh, it's uh, Rob who says it was called basketball until the 70s because we, we didn't play basketball, did we? Not, not Neither boys nor girls, we didn't play basketball. That's what the Americans did. Um, and so, um, yeah, we, we made a switch, but that's that's a really good question. That's... That's the history of language. That's another great love. Yeah. Um, I would only suggest if people um, want to continue the conversation, they can find me on Twitter um, and be more than happy to chat Lois or women's sport history or anything else. Good tip. I've, I've, I've started following Kirby and I think we all should. <laughs> <laughs> me too. <laughs> and if you want any of those Treadley updates from Keith, follow Keith as well. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm a, uh, I'm, I'm uh, it's the, it's the most difficult thing of all is how to, how to tell history stories in under 240 characters, but I'm, I'm, I'm still at it, <laughs> so <laughs> with pictures. Oh, with pictures, brilliant. Oh, excellent. And Rob's just chimed in with another comment saying thank you and uh, we need more webinars on women's sport history. And Rob, we will be pleased to deliver for you, excellent. I'm sure. <laughs> we sure. Uh, very good. Listen, thank you both, Keith and Kirby, for joining us tonight and spending time with us. Thank you to our audience who have tuned in and who have contributed with some great questions and comments and chats. Um, as I said, this webinar is being recorded. We'll edit it and we'll get it up on our SoundCloud uh, and our podcast and our YouTube channel within a couple of weeks. We'll let you all know when it's up and we will email you through some of those other resources and reading materials that both Keith and Kirby have um, alerted you to tonight. Um, and if you haven't already signed up for Talking History, visit our History Trust website or follow us on Facebook and uh, we'll keep you informed of the next uh, Talking History, which is coming up in, in October. Um, and tickets for that will open in a couple of weeks' time. Um, so the, the last thing that's left for me to do is to thank our amazing History Trust team behind the scenes, who you can't see. Uh, but Catherine and Jade are there every month when we go online. They're the tech support. They help you get back in when you drop out. They support our presenters. They, they make everything run really, really smoothly and we couldn't do it without them. So thank you very much to Catherine and to Jade. Um, thank you. Um, and thank you all. And we look forward to welcoming you next month to another edition of Talking History Online. Good night and enjoy your evening.